And all right, we are now, as of this moment, uh, live. And the countdown clock, I will, I'm going to just wait till my Apple computer tells me it's exactly 1050. There we go. Okay. You can see the animated uh, rainbow yin yang. Mm -hmm. I designed that myself. I did all the programming on it. Beautiful. It probably needs an update. It's a little, I think the technology today uh, would make it much smoother. It's still beautiful. Yeah, I'm very happy with it. This I did this like um, 2004, 18 years ago. Wow, wow. that's impressive. <laughs> Given the technology we had then. Yeah. Well, and I had to do each frame individually. There are like 720 wow. frames. Oh my gosh. <laughs> It's a lot of work. Uh, yeah, but it, 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 it was some work, but it was just a question of moving everything, moving the color wheel and moving the, uh, rotating the yin yang like one degree at a time. So the colors shift as the yin yang rotates. Right. And, and the idea, it, it's not perfectly executed, but the idea is that across the S curve, the colors on each side are complementary to each other. But it, as I say, it didn't uh, execute perfectly in that uh, way. Close, but... I was gonna say, it looks pretty close to perfect. Yeah, it's close. It's just, um, you know, if I were to do it again, I'd try to do it a, 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 even better. But I don't know if I'll ever find the time to do it again. Well, I'm sure there's software now that would make it much faster. If I, knew, if I knew how to use such software, <laughs> there's, a, there's a learning curve. Yes, there is. Yeah. On everything. Yeah. This this was done years ago on a program that was very popular back then called Corel Graphics. I don't even know if they're still in business. I remember that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I used that back in in college, maybe <laughs> a long time ago. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, as you get older, it's amazing. I'm <laughs> looking in my closet. I had to redo my closet. I didn't tell you that. We woke up one morning and the metal, the old metal shelves in the closet had collapsed and a whole oh. room, all my clothing was on the floor and there were holes in the wall. And this, no. Janelle no. decided this is the right opportunity to put in a, a brand new closet. Uh, so we have a company that's going to do that, but they say they can't get to it until sometime in January. So meantime, where are your clothes? Well, I'm, some of them are on the floor. Some of them are in the guest room where you stayed in the closet. Mm -hmm. there. And I'm looking through, I'm trying to get rid of, uh, clothes I don't need. So I've gotten rid of many, many large, uh, those big black uh, garbage bags, one for trash bags and, uh, of clothing. And I still have enormous amounts of clothing that I don't need because I used to go into the office every single day and dress up right. in the office. And now I work at home. I don't need those clothes. And I see I've got shirts and suits that are like 25, 30 years old in my closet that I never wear again. So I'm going to keep 
cleaning it out even more. Well, I guess that was a good excuse for you to clean out your closet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when, the, when the whole thing collapses. That, that's, that, it collapsed. It didn't wake you up. Wasn't it loud? No, I guess not, because I didn't discover it until the morning. Oh. You know, it's like all the clothing fell and it was very soft. The rack fell yeah. on top of the clothes. I'm going to go um, refill my teacup and um, I'll be back in like two minutes. Okay. Do you have water or something? I do. Yes. Okay. All right, I'll be right back. Okay. Did I hear a dog barking? Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> I hope that will not happen. It's your dog. Well, it's I my dog. Know. You know, is he in the room with you now or she? No, no. Uh -huh. He's two rooms away uh -huh. behind two doors. And <laughs> if I'm outside, it'll be worse because the room I'm in is against the the exterior wall of the house so it'll sound like he's even closer I so i just hope it, it happened because someone rang the doorbell well so it, you know these things happen and i i'm pretty sure the audience is very forgiving about this sort of thing because they know you know we're not on commercial television right here. This is, this is uh, YouTube, we're both uh, able to, because of uh, modern technology, do this from our homes. It wasn't possible to do such a thing uh, until recent years. Right. And uh, so I think the viewers expect that it's, uh, they're gonna be little glitches and who knows what. I really hope the dog cooperates though. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've done these before and, and there are times when he's wonderful and doesn't make a peep and then other times when I've had to go and actually pick him up and hold him in my lap mm. while I'm, I'm doing this so we'll see okay well we've got less than a minute And we'll be off to the races. All right. You know, we didn't even talk about those Astros. Oh, no. Yeah, oh, for sure. I know how excited you are. 
But I think it's interesting because I, I'll bring this up in a few minutes because we're about to uh, yeah. uh, begin the program. Okay. Okay, and we are now live. Welcome everybody. Um, I'm Jeffrey Mishlov. Uh, I'm here with Elizabeth Crone. Elizabeth is a co-author with Professor Jeffrey Kripal of Rice University of the book, Changed in a Flash about her near-death experience and why Jeffrey Kripal, a very famous scholar of religious studies, thinks it's valuable for everybody. Welcome, Elizabeth, and welcome to all of our viewers. And uh, it's interesting that both you and Jeffrey Kripal are in Houston. That's where Rice University is. And uh, in fact, if I recall correctly, your near-death experience wasn't very far from Rice University. It was across the street. Yeah. It was across the street from Jeff's office mm -hmm. at Rice. So, yeah. yeah. So I, let's talk for uh, uh, to begin with about the Houston Astros. It was just last night that they <laughs> won the World Series, and I know. Uh, that you're a baseball fan and you've been following the uh, playoffs and, and the World Series closely. Uh, we, not long ago, we were at a restaurant together and you kept pulling out your cell phone to keep track of each <laughs> inning. And, uh, but here's the thing that intrigues me, Elizabeth, because during your original near-death experience, which, uh, what year did that take place? 1988. In 1988, at that time, uh, you told me you were given information, I think it was about who was going to win the Super Bowl, which was months, right. months after your experience, if I recall correctly. That is correct. Yeah. And, and, and I, at the time, I had never even seen a Super Bowl game. And still to this day, I mean, football is not my... That's I'm not that interested in it. So it was kind of unusual that that's the information I got. But no. yeah, I, and I suppose the point of it wasn't that who was going to win the Super Bowl so you could place a wager or something. That the point was to explain to you that time when you're in the on the other side is very different from our experience of time here. Right. And another thing I was told was that I was given that information. I asked why they told me about the Super Bowl, because clearly it's not something I had any interest in. And I was told that it would be a trigger for me to help me uh, bring back some of the information that I was given when it happened. And it was in the news. It would trigger me to remember um, some of the things I was taught during my near-death experience. And it worked. It worked beautifully. Uh -huh. Now, were you always a baseball fan? Um, much more so than football. Yeah, I, w I wouldn't even say I'm a huge baseball fan. I'm just, I'm a big Houston fan. <laughs> so, you know, when the Astros are doing well, I'm, I'm a fan. And when <laughs> the Rockets are doing well, I'm a fan. You know, but and it, it's not that often that a Houston team does really well. I mean, the Texans are, are not so great, the football team. So, you know, I, it, the baseball is fun, though. It's a mm -hmm. lot of fun. And they have days where we can take our dog to the ballpark, and that's fun. And um, so, yeah, I like it. Mm -hmm. And it was a lot of fun watching them win the World Series last night. Yeah. 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 Actually, they've already canceled school. Houston Independent S School District has completely canceled school tomorrow. So we can all, uh, seven million of us, go down to the ticker tape parade downtown. <laughs> well, that if that isn't civic pride, I don't know what is. Right. Right. Uh, oh, okay. Now, uh, by way of introduction, 
you were telling me that a, an unusual event happened just last week that you thought might be of interest to our viewers. Yes. Uh, well, especially to you, um, because you, you know me, um, <laughs> I went, uh, we were having, we were having early voting before election day, which will be Tuesday. And so I decided I was going to go vote last week and try and beat the crowds. And so I went to one of the polling places, which is a big community college near our house. And I parked pretty far away from the building and they had volunteers in the parking lot directing people you know, are you here for the community college or are you here to vote? Because it, they were directing us which door to go in through. So uh, a volunteer, a woman in the parking lot said to me, are you here to vote? I said, yes. And she said, then you'll go in that door over there. And I said, thank you. And she kind of made small talk with me as I was walking, talked about what a beautiful day it was and, and, uh, thank you for coming to vote. And I said, well, thank you for volunteering. And, and I went inside the building and the line was about an hour and a half. And I waited and I voted and I left. And when I walked back out into the parking lot, the woman was still there directing people. And she said to me, well, you did your civic duty. And I said, yes, I did. And I was, I was walking toward my car and she said, well, where's the other woman? I said, what other woman? She said, the one you walked in with. <laughs> and I said, I, I was here alone. I didn't come with anyone. She looked at me and she said, yes, you did. She said, the, the older woman with the slim build and the white hair with the beautiful blue and green uh, blouse with the big decorative buttons and she was describing it in such detail and I said I was alone and and at that point I couldn't get to my car fast enough because she was describing perfectly my mother who passed away eight weeks ago and she uh, we had taken clothes to the funeral home for her to be buried in and it was a it was the blouse that she was describing. It was the blue and, and green blouse with the big decorative buttons. And uh, so she was describing my mother that apparently was walking with me into the building and, and I was not aware of it. So I found that pretty interesting. And the woman was looking at me like I was crazy. She kept saying, she said, did you leave her inside? <laughs> And I, I really um, needed to get to my car at that point. So I, I thought it was interesting. I, um, I'm, I'm sure that she did see my mom. And I kind of am wondering why I didn't, why I didn't sense that she was there, but I didn't. So well, you, I can attest that uh, I, you have sent me a photo of your mother. And as I, I recall, there was some discussion that we had because it was a photo of your mother laid out in her casket wearing that beautiful blue-green blouse. And, and we talked about uh, the fact that you wondered, was it even proper to take such a photograph? And I pointed out that my wife had done the same thing with her mother. And uh, so I'm well aware of, of the blouse and uh, how, how significant it was to you, uh, because if I remember rightly, it was her favorite blouse. Right. I, I actually, after I calmed down and got home, I went back a few hours later to look for the woman that had said that to me because I wanted to ask her. I, I really wanted to know, um, did she look happy? <laughs> did she, you know, um, I had questions and I went back and I, I couldn't find the woman and I asked another volunteer where she was and she said, oh, they move us around. And so she had been moved to a different location and I couldn't find her. So I, I don't know. 
She might have been, for all we know, a, a particularly sensitive individual to be able to see your mother. And, but you yourself yes. are such a sensitive yeah. individual. I, I, I am really surprised that I didn't have any idea that mom was there. So, yeah. You know, it does remind me of um, the conversation I had must have been two months ago, or maybe one month ago, I was in England, and Lorna Byrne, who, who has been interviewed on this channel, we haven't released it yet. She is a best-selling author in the United Kingdom. She's very famous over there. Uh, she sees angels. And she says, we're all surrounded by angels. Uh, and she had a funny way of putting it. She said, uh, I, when someone asked her, well, what are the angels doing? And she says, well, they're very sad. Uh, I asked her once, why are they sad? She says, well, they're out of work. <laughs> I said, what does that mean? She said, people aren't calling on them <laughs> to, for help. They want, they want you to ask them to help them. And I, I joked with her. I said, well, I'd like to give my angels a raise because they're doing so much for me <laughs> that I never even asked for. But, uh, you know, we don't, I, I would imagine that most of our viewers are probably surrounded this way by, by loved ones. I'll call them angels. I know Swedenborg, for example, said, yes, all angels are deceased loved ones. And uh, we don't realize that the, they're watching us. They're many times looking out for us. Of course, they have their own evolution. It's not as if they have nothing else to do on the other side, but uh, try to be helpful to their uh, relatives who are still living. Right. I, I, all I can say is I hope that, um, that my mom is here with me. And I, I do believe she is, and I do believe she is an angel and um, a guide, and I, I hope she's watching out for us. Well, we've got a lot of questions uh, coming in from our viewers already. So uh, let me begin with Dr. Stephen Brule, who asks, mm -hmm. do you believe in the concept of a soul family and if so, how would you explain that? I personally do believe in that. Um, if, if what you're calling a soul family is um, a group of souls that tend to uh, come back together, stay in the same group, um, I do believe in that because, I mean, take my children, for example, uh, each of my children, when each of them were born and I first looked into their eyes, I knew them. I, I, I knew who they were. I, they were familiar to me. So, um, and, and that was even before I had my near death experience. Um, and I was very skeptical of anything like that. So I kind of wrote it off as just kind of a, a, postnatal craziness or something but I did feel like I knew my children and and now it's happening with my grandchildren every time I hold a new grandchild and we have nine of them so far um, I feel like I know this person I know this soul I've been with them before so yes I do strongly believe in that and um, now it's very interesting in certain cultures, particularly the Northwest Indians, the uh, Indians of, of, of Canada, for example, uh, believe that you get reincarnated into the same family and they plan for that and, and they expect it. But you once had an experience you told me about with one of your grandchildren who, who, who came up to you and, and uh, said to you that, uh, you were once her grandchild. No, she said to me, she's three now. I think she said this to me um, when she was about two and a half, maybe three. She said, Grandma, remember when I was the grandma and you were the baby? Mm -hmm. And I was, it just was stunning to me because actually 
yes, I do remember that. <laughs> so um, it, it's fascinating to me. So talking about soul family, that would be a, a good example. Here's a question from Lily Gazoo. Hello, Lily. And the question is, what do you see in our near future and how can we best prepare for changes? Can our ancestors help us? Well, I'm, I'm not sure if you're asking about um, humanity in general. Um, what do I see in our near future? I see, you know, Humans are always evolving. Change is always happening. Um, if you're asking, do I see a big uh, world war or do I see, um, are you asking specifically about the upcoming elections or I, I'm not really sure where you want me to go with that. Um, I don't see any major changes uh, coming up in the foreseeable future, um, other than the change that normally happens anyway. I mean, if, if you look back at humans 50 years ago, um, yeah, there have been changes. A, a big part of that I attribute to technology and our interaction with technology and with each other because of the technology. And that will continue to happen and we will continue to evolve with that. Um, I'm sorry, Jeffrey, I don't know if I'm answering the question. Well, maybe Lily will post something more specific and, and we'll come back uh, to that. But for now, I'll move on. Okay. And um, Andre Slavash Krasowski, uh, who I know has many questions and has been a regular a uh, viewer and commenter on our live streams asks, what was your opinion about parapsychology before you had the near-death experience? My opinion before my near-death experience was, it was a joke. I was, I, I had to be the biggest skeptic there ever was. Um, and, and maybe that's part of the reason this happened to me. Um, but I, I never would have believed anyone saying the things that I say now. Um, I, I, I thought it, it just couldn't possibly be. And so I guess, um, you know, I was struck by lightning and had a near-death experience and that changed everything in an instant. And, um, yeah, so I was uh, I was a big skeptic, and now I'm a big believer because I understand it because I've seen it, I've lived it, I know. I, I there's no question that consciousness survives death. So, and if someone had said that to me um, in 1987, I would have laughed at them, and then in 1988, it was a completely different story. Now, I think it would be fair to say, uh, since your near-death experience occurred when you were in the parking lot of a synagogue, you were about to go into religious services, that you were a uh, religious person. And I know the Jewish religion does not emphasize the afterlife, but it doesn't deny it either. Right. And I, I had a lot of difficulty after my near-death experience. Um, finding a rabbi that would listen to me and, and talk to me, really just listen to me and, and tell me I wasn't crazy. Um, because I don't know if it's because they just had never studied near-death experiences. You know, actually the, the term near-death experience was fairly new when this happened to me. Uh, that term just came about in 1975 when Raymond Moody wrote his book and this was 1988, so it hadn't been that long. It was a new, fairly new topic. 
And um, I had a lot of trouble finding any clergy person that would talk to me. And the, the near-death experience itself made me much more spiritual. Well, <laughs> it made me spiritual. I was not spiritual at all before. Uh, and I am now, and it made me much less religious. I, it, I'm, I'm not a big fan of organized religion any longer. Okay, I'm going to uh, go to the next question. This is from Elizabeth Lord, who was one of our volunteers. Uh, and Elizabeth asks, how did it feel when you got your first premonition that was confirmed? Terrifying. It was absolutely terrifying. Uh, I, it was about three months after my near-death experience, and I received a premonition about the death of a woman uh, whom I did not know, but I knew someone who knew her. And I was determined to find out um, if in fact it had happened. And I went and spoke to the person that knew her and I was correct, it had happened. And, and I asked the universe, why, why even tell me about this woman's death? I don't know her. I, why would you even tell me? And the, the reason was not, not to tell me of her death, but to teach me that I could know about things before they happened, that I could receive information. And one of the big lessons that I got during my near-death experience was the lesson about time and time not being linear. And <clears throat> so um, I it's not that I know things before they happen necessarily, but I know things sometimes before they happen again, because I do believe that time is kind of simultaneous and, um, and that things uh, that happened before are still happening and will happen again, kind of all at the same time, but in different dimensions. I don't know how else to explain it. Mm. Well, uh, another one of our viewers, Tony Haynes, says he'd love to hear more about what he calls the time effect. So if uh, let me elaborate a bit, um, because just yesterday I was on a uh, panel with uh, Eben Alexander, probably the most famous near-death experiencer uh, presently. Um, he was a neurosurgeon, like you, a complete skeptic until he uh, went into a coma that lasted uh, about a week. And the way he points out is that, yes, it's as if the future has already happened, but at the same time, he emphasized very, very strongly that doesn't mean we have no free will. He said, we still have our free will, even if the future has already happened. And that's totally mind boggling. I don't know how, how one begins to grapple with that, you know, using our puny human consciousness, but uh, that seems to be uh, the way things are. I, I wonder if you have any thoughts about that. I have a lot of thoughts about that. Uh, I think about that all the time, actually. Uh, one of my, my, biggest um, premonition groups is disasters. And I get premonitions about plane crashes. And thus, I now hate to fly. I do it because I have to, but I don't like it. Anyway, I, I get these premonitions about plane crashes. And my feeling is, <laughs> Absolutely, free will plays into this. So if a plane is going to crash and I know about it, to me that says uh, that plane has crashed before and that plane is crashing right now and that plane will crash again. And, but, but the mechanics that work on the plane have free will. And if one of them finds a loose screw and tightens it, 
before that plane takes off, it could prevent that crash from happening again. And that changes the trajectory of that event in, in every dimension. And it, you know, it was so much easier. I, I have no background in physics at all. Um, my, my educational background is in business and law, not, not anything having to do with science. And I have a very difficult time understanding physics. But during my near-death experience, I completely understood. I, it was so clear and so easy to understand. And now I feel like I'm back here and it's like trying to make my way through, through muck every day. Everything is so not clear and so murky and, and difficult. And, um, and physics for me is one of those things. So I can't really explain it um, other than to say, uh, I, I got it while I was there in the afterlife. And, and here, I, I still understand it. I understand the nonlinear nature of time and, and all of that because it was explained to me. But uh, I don't understand it as easily as I did when I was there. And I would imagine one of the problems is finding language that uh, to put it into words, where, whereas I, I presume when you're on the other side, things are being explained to you, not in, in the English language, maybe it's more telepathic. It was completely telepathic. And it was instantaneous. It was, it was an instantaneous download. I, I just had the answers. As quickly as I thought of a question, I had the answers and the understanding and the background, everything. And yes, it was all telepathic. There, there was no spoken word. There were no spoken words. So, uh, and it was very fast. Okay, here's a question from a viewer whose YouTube name is Modern Monastery. And uh, Modern Monastery says, Hi, Elizabeth. Why are many NDEers either told they cannot stay or are almost manipulated into, quote, choosing to return. It seems forced and contrary to our free will. Do you have a perspective on this? I can only speak to my own experience. And in my experience, uh, there was nothing forced about it. I easily, I was given a, a choice and I easily could have stayed there. I in many ways preferred to stay there. Um, but, you know, I feel like you can only really make progress when you're here uh, in this, this plane, this dimension. And I, you know, this happened when I was 28 years old and I kind of didn't want to waste the 28 years I had invested already in, in this life. And, so I decided to come back and finish raising my family and uh, my children and um, do whatever it was I had agreed to, to do before I came here and make the progress I wanted to make in this life. You can't do it when you're in the afterlife. You have to do it when you're here. So I, I just wanted to maximize the time that I had already spent here and the effort that I had already put into this. And, um, and I now know um, what's waiting for me when I do die. I have no fear of death and, um, and it'll be there. It'll be there for me when I'm finished with what I'm doing here, hopefully. Okay. Here, uh, I'll, I'll just mention that we're at the bottom of the hour, just about, and we'll continue for another hour. So uh, just so our viewers know that. Here's a question from Liz, or Lisa, or Liza, 
NYC. Somebody named Liza, I think that NYC must mean New York City. And she says, Elizabeth, I had a similar experience to your receiving a phone call from the other side, which you, we've talked about in our previous interviews. Why do you think they are only able to make these types of contact once? And I wonder if you have thoughts on that. <laughs> I have thoughts on everything. It doesn't mean my thoughts are correct, but yes, I, I have thoughts. Um, I don't believe they can only make a call one time. I do believe my understanding is that it takes a tremendous amount of energy. Everything about the afterlife is energy and related to energy and the amount of energy that is stored and can be expended. And I, I understand that making a physical object here move, or in the case of a telephone ring, uh, takes an enormous amount of energy. And I don't know if that's something they have to store up for a long time in order to make it happen, um, or if they have to be of a certain energy level to make it happen. It, I know it's not easy. It's not easy. It's it's a great way to get our attention. You know, the phone rang. It actually rang. And I wasn't the only one that heard it. There were two of us. So that phone really rang. And I really did talk to my grandfather. And I, I and he said to me at the end of that conversation, I said, please don't hang up. And he said, I have to, I, he was running very low on energy. Um, he did say he would contact me again. And I, I believe him. Uh, he has not made a phone ring again, to my knowledge, at least not for me. Uh, but I do believe that he has contacted me again. And I think he had to make that happen to get my attention. I mean, that was a real attention grabber. You know, the phone rings, you hear it, and it causes you to act. It was a landline. So, um, and we were asleep. It woke us up. So it was a, it was a very effective method to communicate. And, and I recall because your husband was in bed with you when the phone rang in the middle of the night and kept saying, who are you talking to? Who are you talking to? And you're waving at him like to be quiet. And, uh, but I asked you at one point, what would have happened had you handed the phone to him? And, and you said you thought he would only have heard white noise, which is very interesting because I had a similar experience in a lucid dream with my deceased friend, Elizabeth Targ. And just as I was saying to her, oh, Elizabeth, I'm so happy to see you. I've heard so many wonderful things about your communications from the other side, especially the physical ones. And at that moment, the phone next to my bed, the landline rang. I picked it up, but all I heard was white noise. Really? Yeah, yeah I, that's what I believe he would have heard had I handed him the phone. The call wasn't for him. It was for me. So I don't think he would have heard my grandfather's voice the way I did. Um, but yeah, I think he would have heard white noise or static. Some He would have heard something, but it wouldn't have been words. So in, in my case, it suggests that Elizabeth Targ had the energy to make the phone ring, but right. for whatever reason, maybe I wasn't attuned or something between us didn't require a, a physical conversation. And so that didn't happen, but it was enough to let me know that uh, because it happened right at that moment, and as I was having a lucid dream about her, that this was a, a message from her. Absolutely. Yeah. That's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. So now we have a, um, another question from Crystal. Crystal A, 
who says, hello, Elizabeth. Do you think we experience the afterlife depending on our beliefs? I mean, the way we want it to be. I believe the afterlife is um, largely dependent on our expectations, on what we expect it to be. Um, not just our beliefs, but our what we expect based on our our lives. Um, if if you've if you've been a, a good person who who has been very loving and giving and generous and and helpful to other people, you would probably expect a, a good experience in the afterlife and would would receive that. I do think that our expectations play a huge role in our afterlife experiences. Um, you know, my experience was that I went to a garden, which is exactly what I would expect my heaven to look like. I love gardens, I love flowers, and, and that's what I saw. And so yes, the answer is yes, definitely. Okay, and here is a question from Manaj Shankar, who asks, during your NDE, did you meet anyone you knew? Yes, uh, I was greeted by my grandfather, who had passed away um, a, a year, almost to the day, um, earlier than, than my NDE. So that, that's who greeted me. And um, I, I, I thought that's who it was. I'll put it that way. I thought it was my grandfather. It, at first um, I heard his voice and he had a heavy French accent and I knew it was my grandfather. And he asked me to sit on a bench and then proceeded to tell me that our conversation would now take place telepathically. So I didn't hear his voice again after that. Um, but I, from that point on, I do not believe it was my grandfather. At, at that point, I believe it was God that was giving me this information and answering my questions. Um, but yes, I, I also want to say that um, I'm not real sure that, that where I was in that garden was the complete afterlife. I, I believe there's much more to it. And um, I believe that uh, at a point when, when I go back to that garden and decide to stay there permanently, I will see a lot of my deceased relatives at that point. Okay. And here, the Vitor Santos asks, this is a complex question. Hello, he says, when you had the NDE, and there's some grammatical, I'll just repeat it as written, you felt connected with all, or you felt it was all that is, or did you feel as you feel on this moment? Um, no, I did not feel as I feel at this moment. I felt I had an understanding instantly that every soul is connected, that we are all one, we are all one and we are, are all, uh, there's a part of each of our souls that comes from God and we are all connected. I, I just, to me, it, my understanding is we are one, we are all one. And I felt that there, um, being back here, um, Academically, I know that we're all one. However, I don't feel it the way I felt it there. I don't feel 
the connections with other people, the way I felt the connections with all the other souls there. I can appreciate that. I know pretty much all of the interviews, especially the really good interviews that I do, all point to that exact axiom that we are all one. But then I have a hard time struggling with, does that mean I'm all one with political figures, for example, with whom I strongly disagree? I have to be one with them. Oh, no. You know, it, it's hard. It's it's really hard because it's not just political figures, but criminals. I mean, how how can I be connected to someone that's committed horrific crimes? But we are. We are all one. Yeah, I strongly agree with that. I strongly agree with that, and especially having worked in the psychiatric unit in San Quentin prison in group therapy sessions with murderers and rapists. I've come to appreciate that they're just as human as any other person I've ever met, in spite of, of what you they've know, done. I, I have to say, uh, several years ago, I, I was um, picked to be on a jury and it was a murder trial. And uh, there was something, at one point, the accused murderer looked at me and our eyes connected and I felt some, you know, here he had committed this terrible, terrible, the worst crime, the worst crime. And I realized, that there was a connection. I, you know, I, I felt it. Okay, I'm going to move on. Laura Newbert, who is also one of our volunteers, has asked, what are the anomalous side effects of your experience? For example, has lucid dreaming increased? And if so, how? Hmm. Well, we can start with the uh, premonitions uh, that I get of plane crashes and other disasters, natural disasters, plane crashes are not natural disasters, but tsunamis and earthquakes and, and um, things like that. Um, interestingly, I, I did not have any premonition about 9-11 of terrorism. And I, you know, I think possibly the reason I didn't get any premonition about that is because at any instant during the course of that morning, uh, the entire course of history could have been changed. Had, had one person done one thing differently and, you know, the plane not crashed into the World Trade Center, um, and, and I had no premonition of that, but it's the premonitions of not terrorist acts, but just plane crashes, accidents and, and pilot error, that kind of thing um, that, that really um, gets to me. And, you know, people say sometimes you've got a gift well, it doesn't really feel like a gift. It, it, I, I've come to terms with, I, I live with it now, I, and I'm at peace with it, but I still don't like it when I have those premonitions. Um, I, there's also uh, the fact that I can see um, ghosts. I can see spirits sometimes. There's one actually that lives in our house. And at one point in time, three of our children were, were living here and I could see her, the ghost. Our dog could see her and would bark at her. And one of my children could see her and described to me exactly what she was wearing. I saw her. And the other two children didn't see her. So um, I, I have that. Um, I've also developed something called synesthesia, 
um, since my near-death experience um, where words are related to colors and numbers are related to colors, like the number five, when I hear the number five or see the number five, I'm thinking red and it's always red. Um, and, it, you know, as people are talking to me, I'm hearing their words in color, which is really strange. Um, I also see auras around people. And it's, you know, when I'm speaking, not on Zoom or, or YouTube, but when I'm speaking to a, a live group of people and I'm looking out at the people, I just see a riot of colors, the auras that are around each person that kind of um, meld together. They come together and, and blend and it's, it's crazy. But so it's things like that uh, that I live with now that I never had before 1988. I have a question from Ethan Margolith, one of our regular viewers, who asks, do you believe there are negative entities around us? I believe it's possible. Um, I don't really choose to focus on that um, because I don't want to, <laughs> because I don't want to think about it. I do believe that there are negative entities in the afterlife. And um, I do believe that, um, that we have to deal with them at some point. Um, I, I don't know. I, I think logic would tell me that, yes, they're around us. Yes, they're here. Um, but I don't, I choose to ignore them. Okay, and here is a question. I mean, we could spend a whole hour talking about the negative yes. entities and, and what to do. And I would encourage Ethan and viewers who are interested to go through the listings on the New Thinking Aloud channel. And you'll see we've done whole programs uh, about that. Uh, now, here's another question from Cosmic Mind. Is your impression following the NDE that your life is somehow determined in advance like a movie? Yes, I do believe that. That's one of the things I was told during my near-death experience is that uh, before a person is born, that soul uh, agrees to certain things. That doesn't mean that we don't have free will. Once we're here, of course we do. But, you know, I was specifically asking, does that mean that I agreed to be struck by lightning? And the answer was yes, I did. Um, because it, it, if you want to make certain progress, I mean, really, there's no point in coming back if you don't want to make progress. So to progress, um, when you're in the afterlife and you're given information about what, what you need to experience still or this time around, you can decide, uh, I'll do this, but I won't do that. And knowing that at some point you're gonna have to come back and do whatever that was. Um, so yeah, I, I yes, it's, it's kind of like a, I wouldn't say a contract, but, an agreement that certain things will happen uh, in this lifetime. <laughs> and so I also asked, does that mean uh, what? So if I agreed to get struck by lightning, what if I had left my house five minutes later and that thunderstorm was over and there was no lightning when I got out of my car? And I was told then it would have happened on another day. I agreed to it. It would have happened on another day. And I do believe that. 
And I've got a question here from Freedom and Rights for U.S., who asks, what's it like dealing with the implications that higher beings are watching? I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, Would you accept the premise? Yes and no. I once once we die and we our body dies and we are in the afterlife. I did not feel judged at all. I did not feel that there was somebody passing judgment on me. I was judging myself. I, we're our own harshest critics. So um, that, that's, that's really difficult for me to say because yes, there are higher entities watching us, but they are us. We are those entities watching ourselves, judging ourselves. Beautifully put, in my opinion. Uh, and now I've got a question from Fire Opal Sky, who asks, or states, uh, some say children are taught to forget more than most people know when it comes to spiritual matters. Do you have memories of your childhood where you, quote, experienced spirit contacts? I do not. Um, I did not know any of this existed, to my knowledge, before my near-death experience when I was 28 years old. Um, however, I know that there are children a lot of children that have memories of previous lifetimes. And <clears throat> those memories seem to fade as the children grow up. And I don't think it's a, a conscious effort on the part of the adults in their lives to, to quiet them and make them stop talking about it as much as it is a function of growing up and becoming more aware of this dimension and what's going on in this dimension that takes up more space in their, in their brain. And they're not living so much in the past anymore. And I, you know, I've never studied um, children's memories like that, but I know there are a lot of people that have and and there's a lot of literature out there on it. So I, I and personally, I do not remember having those memories, no. Okay, now for a change of pace. C. Funk asks, can you please tell us about your work as a board member at uh, the Bigelow Institute for Consciousness Studies Will you be one of the judges for the $1 million grant uh, research program? This is a good time, I think, to at least uh, remind our viewers that if, if you consider yourself a, a researcher, someone with credentials uh, who can provide uh, contact and communication and wisdom from the other side, you should go to bigelowinstitute.org and learn about the million dollars of funding for such research that will be given out uh, in, the, in the next year. Uh, but, uh, what would you, do you have, would you like to comment on that at all, Elizabeth? Well, it's still pretty early in the process. I mean, Bix just started accepting uh, proposals on November 1st. So we haven't even had a board meeting yet since the proposals have started coming in. I would imagine that um, all of the board members will, will be involved. Uh, I just don't know what that involvement is yet. It's pretty early in the process. I do know it's important though to, to tag on to what Jeffrey was just saying, 
to say that um, if you do feel like you want to submit a proposal to to earlier is better because they're going to be approved on a rolling basis. And once the million dollars is is gone, it's gone. So um, I I wouldn't waste time. I the deadline I believe is January first. Uh, to get the proposals in, but if you can do it before then, it would probably be in your best interest to do so. As far as my other work on the board, um, really all I can say is that what Robert Bigelow is is doing is very noble. Um, He is putting a lot of time and money and effort into the study of the survival of consciousness after bodily death. And and we're talking more scientific study, not, um, you know, he's looking, when he did the essay contest, which is where he largely derived his board members was from the essay winners and Uh, When he did the essay contest, he was looking for, the question was, he wanted the best evidence that consciousness survives. Now he's leaning away from evidence and looking more for proof, which is a a much, much higher mountain to climb. Um, So that's where we're headed. That's what the board is working on and, and supporting him in his endeavors to to reach that. I would say proof may not be the word of choice I would have used. I would have said wisdom. He is looking for wisdom. Absolutely. He's looking for communication. He's looking for communication with the afterlife in which we receive wisdom. That's, that's what he's looking for. And he's got, I mean, I, he's got a great team of people on this board. It's, it's fantastic. And I really, really hope we can accomplish something, something notable. Okay. Um, Glenn Zubris asks, during your experience, did you see any entities that we on earth would consider ETs or aliens? Did I see them? Was that the question? Or did you uh, see them? But I think he meant experience them in in any way. No, I did not. Um, What I saw, I saw uh, what appeared to be humans uh, in the distance from the bench I was sitting on in the garden um, and they were all paired up. Every human there was paired up with someone else, which I believe was their, their guide. And every human there looked to be about 18 or 20 years old and um, in, in perfect health. And that's what I saw. I did not see any type of alien creature, no. Very good. And uh, Taharka Taharja asks, is it possible that human souls take animal form? I suppose anything is possible. I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I know that I, I I don't know the answer. I and I hesitate to to even say anything about it. I do believe that we are our pets that we have when we're here will meet us again um, in the afterlife. But as far as a human soul taking on an animal form, I don't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> 
Okay, and I'll, uh, since we're near the top of the hour, I'll just remind our viewers that we're going to continue for uh, another 30 minutes and, until we get to the bottom of the hour. And I have a question from Jesse Morales, who asks, what are your thoughts about the transition of people who decide to end their own lives? You know, my thoughts on that are, again, I, I hesitate to say much. It's, it's more um, an opinion. I, I don't know for a fact anything about it. I did, that's not something that I asked about when I was in the afterlife. Um, I suspect that um, these are people that are in a lot of pain, whether it's emotional pain or physical pain or, or both. And um, are not taking their own lives. Um, I, I don't know how to word this. They're not. They're. If you're asking, do I believe they um, go to a bad place in the afterlife? No, I do not. I do not. I believe there's healing that takes place there. And um, again, in my experience, uh, they are their own judges. So it's not like there's some other entity passing judgment on them for something they did. They are judging themselves and they know their reasons for doing it and and healing takes place there and that's really all i feel comfortable saying about that okay here is a very interesting question from matthew stevens who's who asks did your near-death experience change your tolerance for suffering and self-sacrifice and serving others and if so, how? Change my tolerance. Um, it made me a much more understanding person, a much more giving person, a more loving person. Um, it made me, uh, because I immediately understood that we're all connected. I came back wanting to help everybody. I came back wanting to make the world a wonderful place and of course I can't fix it all myself and um, nor can any other person that's had a near-death experience come back and fix everything themselves but speaking from, I wanted to I wanted to do that and so I understand people that are like that um, I don't think Tolerance is the right word because I was never intolerant of people that are overly giving and loving. So I, it's just that I became one of them and or more like them. I'm not going to say I'm some saint, but um, I did become more like that. Mm -hmm. Your, your politics changed quite a bit, I believe. My politics did change quite a bit. And, um, and again, my, my views toward organized religion changed quite a bit. I Really, there's nothing about me that didn't change. So, yeah. Okay. okay. Now, uh, if what's going to happen if I switch over to the gallery, people are going to see uh, not only myself, but we have another uh, sort of visitor. But uh, that that's my wife, Janelle, who's uh, uh, listening in. And anyway, uh, s s there she is. <laughs> Stephen Klemecki asks, he's wondering if we can, in the afterlife, communicate with famous people from the past that we 
admire in this life? I don't know. It's interesting. That's a great question because uh, the, the clergy person that I eventually found to help me was an Episcopalian minister. And the first thing he said to me when we met was, did you see Jesus? And I said, no, I did not. And he said, then I don't think you had a near-death experience, which was uh, kind of amusing because yes, I did. <laughs> and he, of course he, over the years, changed his mind and actually went on to study the Jewish and Muslim near-death experiences and, and other cultures. But what I realized was, number one, I didn't see Jesus because I didn't expect to see Jesus because I'm Jewish. And because I, I, I wouldn't expect to see Jesus. So I didn't. And like I said before, it's all our expectation. It's what we expect. And second of all, I started thinking, well, maybe I did see Jesus and didn't recognize him because why would I recognize him? So maybe I did. So maybe when we're there, we do see famous people. I mean, Jesus was a very famous person. And so maybe we do see famous people there. And if it's someone that you're specifically looking for or want to interact with, maybe that's possible. I was not specifically looking for Jesus or looking to interact with him. So I, I don't know if that could have happened had I been looking for him. Okay. Um, I'm going to go back now to some questions uh, from people who had a chance to ask and have multiple questions. And so we've got one from Andre Slavash Krasowski who asks, what are the reactions to your story? Are, are they more often hostile, friendly, or something in the middle? It depends on who I'm talking to. If I'm talking to a group of people um, such as I'm speaking with today, it's generally pretty friendly and accepting and hospitable. If I am talking to... Um, a group of, say, um, my husband's coworkers, um, who who are not generally part of a group like this. Um, I've learned not to talk about it because the reaction is not friendly. It's it's usually very mocking, and um, and hurtful. So I don't talk about, it. I mean, you learn really fast who you feel safe talking in front of and who you don't. And you also grow a very tough skin. So um, even the mocking and, and the finger pointing and the laughing kind of rolls off me at this point. It's never fun, but I can deal with it now. Um, and then there's a group of my own my own family and my own friends. Um, one of the things Jeffrey Kripal and I talked about before we wrote our book, he said to me, be prepared. You're going to lose a lot of friends. You know, once this book is published, you're going to lose friends. And, and he was right. I did. I lost a lot of friends. However, he also said, you're going to make a lot of new friends who are much more aligned in their thinking to the way you are now, which also is very true and has happened. So, and, and as far as my family, there are members of my family who completely agree with everything I've said. And there are members of my family who make fun of me. Uh, to my face or behind my back, which is even worse. And, um, you know, all I can say to people like that is you'll find out. <laughs> that's, that's really all I can say. You'll see. And, um, and so that's pretty much it. 
And here's a question from Tony Haynes, uh, who asks, who says he would love to hear you describe the weeks in heaven. And I know you say it was about two weeks time-wise. How did you know it was two weeks and not five minutes? Okay, so I knew that it was two weeks because there was, it's, it's really, it sounds like a contradiction to say there was a calendar marking time while I was there because time doesn't exist linearly. So why would there have been a calendar? There was a calendar that was marking time. And I believe that the reason that that existed was that I have to remember the whole experience in linear terms in order to decipher the information I was given. Otherwise, it's too overwhelming. I have to think of it in linear terms, even though I know it was not a linear experience. Um, so there, there, was a, there were orbs in the sky. They were like moon bodies. And the way they were moving in relation to each other, I understood the passage of time. And I understood that how much time was passing and it was two weeks. Back here, once I woke up or became conscious here again, um, I realized that it had only been maybe two minutes, maybe. Um, but that's meaningless. It, 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 there is no physical way I could have gotten the information and the knowledge that I got in two minutes. It, it could not have happened in two earth minutes. So um, anyway, that's how I know about the passage of time there and that it was two weeks because I was watching these bodies move and it was a calendar, I knew. Okay, and now Emmy Vatness, who is a co-host now on New Thinking Aloud and is volunteering uh, on this live stream, asks, how and why did your views on organized religion change? What were they before your near-death experience, and what are they now? Um, before my near-death experience, I just pretty much took things at face value. I didn't question anything. I didn't really delve into any depth. You know, if I was told you're Jewish and, and you know, this is what Moses did, then I believed it. I didn't question anything. Um, however, I now understand that organized religion is a, a human construct um, that, that we have put into place for, for many, many reasons. And it just does not make sense to me anymore. Um, a lot of things don't make sense to me anymore. You know, it was, it was much easier uh, before my near-death experience. Life was easier, not just because I was young, which I was, but because I, I didn't question things. Now I'll question everything, everything. And organized religion just doesn't sit well with me at all. It doesn't feel right um, because we're all one. It all goes back to that. We're all part of the same and so how can there be all these different religions if we're all the same? We're all part of the same one. Um, so it, it just doesn't make sense to me anymore. And I have a hard time with it. Well, and I suppose that's because so many religions have uh, a, a sense of exclusivity or, or tribalism. Uh, I know 
yesterday, just last night, I had a wonderful interview. I was on a channel with a fellow, um, Daniel Ott, who uh, has a you know, podcast that refers to himself as the Cosmic Cowboy. And we had a wonderful time together. And he explained to me that he is a, a devout Christian. And he even played on the interview this beautiful opening sequence he has. Of, uh, a, a, it's a song, and he's illustrated it with, about a cowboy who re meets a shining stranger in the desert, and they go off for a ride on their mountains and the prairies. And then the cowboy explains that his daddy's ranch is the whole cosmos. And you realize, oh, he's riding with Jesus. And then, but then he says, but you can only get to my daddy through me. <laughs> I was with him up until that moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, I have a real hard time with that. I, yeah. Yeah. But, but it's also true that one of your sons, who was a tiny child who was with you at the moment you had your near-death experience is now an adult. He is an Orthodox rabbi living in Israel. No, actually, he lives here in Houston. Oh. But yes, he is an Orthodox rabbi. And he and I, um, we butt heads about this all the time. You know, it's almost, I was holding his hand. He was two years old when I was struck by lightning and I was holding his hand when it happened. And it's almost like what happened, that experience made me less religious and made him more religious at the same time. It's really interesting what happened um, because he definitely was not raised that way. I mean, I, I was, we're, we're, reform Jews, which is already, you know, Judaism light. And, and then after my near death experience, I was even less enthralled with religion. And yet he has completely um, gone the other direction. Interesting. Yeah. And, and yes, disagree all the time. I adore him. We have a great relationship. But we we do get into some pretty heated discussions. Now, speaking of a heated discussion, I have a question from Lady Tanya Alexis, who asks, what about all those aborted babies? Any encounters, she wants to know. Any? Did I encounter any? I, I have no idea. I mean, I saw lots of souls there. I, but like I said, they all look to be about the same age. Um, that's not to say that an aborted baby wouldn't look like an 18 year old in heaven, because to me, I think they would, it, it's still a soul. And, and so um, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. Not that wasn't something I asked about or, or learned anything about. And here um, is another uh, question along the same lines, a far out question. It's really a comment, but maybe you have thoughts ab about it. It's from somebody whose internet name is preliming, preliminary, uh, preliminal. I, I want to say preliminal, but it's preliminal, preliminal. I can't pronounce it. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I would like to preli mini mole, preli mini mole. There we go. And uh, the question is, or the statement really is, I did not have an NDE. However, I transferred to a parallel earth from the Sagittarius arm to the Orion arm version of earth in 2016. He visited a parallel version of our earth. And why are there parallel earths is his question. Or her question. I do. I believe they exist. Yes, I do. I I don't know why. I don't know um, how. Um, but I would love to talk to this person. I I would love to 
to hear about that experience. But no, I, I don't know anything about it. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that you told me, Elizabeth, that does seem relevant to this question is that the experience of the afterlife is unique for everyone. And, and so it, it may well be that uh, this, this is a unique experience for that, for prelim minimal to, to have had that experience, uh, somehow due, due to their upbringing or due to their past lives or, or something about them at the soul level. I, I know, for example, that many people believe themselves to have had past lifetimes on other planets. In fact, I think I questioned you about that once and, and you said uh, something similar. Yeah, I... I... I just don't know. I don't know enough about it to really say anything, except that, like you pointed out, uh, that if that was the expectation, um, then it's possible that that's what they saw because that's what they expected to see. Although he or she, I'm not sure which, um, did say it was not a near-death experience. So I don't know what kind of experience it was, you know, um, so I, I really don't know. Could have been an out-of-body experience. And I tend to think that the near-death experience is pretty much akin to mystical experiences that are reported in all cultures, uh, in, the, in the lives right. of saints and so on. Right. But I don't know what brings on that experience, whether it's a, a deep meditation, whether it's a, a, you know, a psychedelic drug. What you know, I, I don't know, and I don't know if it matters what brings on that that state. It I don't know. Well, we have more questions coming in. Uh, and again, these are questions to which I don't expect you'll necessarily have an answer, but Scott Preston asks, don't they have access to infinite energy in the cosmos? When you're in the afterlife, can you access infinite energy? I don't know. I mean, there is infinite energy, I, but I don't know how to access it. I'm, I'm sure that, that there is a way, um, but I don't know if it's something that is, is if there's a, a, a moderator who, who says you can have this much energy if you do this, or, or if you just uh, go to the energy bank and take what you need. I don't know. I do know that when my grandfather called me on the phone, he made it very clear that he was low on energy. So. Okay. And you know, when I switch to the gallery, I see uh, because uh, Janelle, my wife, who has been a guest on uh, one of our live streams before, her new book, A Complaint is a Gift, in, in its third edition, has just been released. So that's what this placard uh, is, is about that is, is showing up here. Um, we'll, we'll do a program with Janelle in the future about the significance of complaints uh, and the significance of feedback. Um, Skyworks 600 asks, what if end of life experience is the last imprint of the mind when time ceases for the individual developed around cultural beliefs? Well, time doesn't cease for the individual. So I, I don't know that that question makes sense to me um, because yeah, your cultural beliefs help shape your expectations. And therefore, um, what your afterlife experience will be like initially. Uh, can that change? Of course it can. I, you know, once you're in the afterlife, anything can happen. It, 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 anything. You can change to different, uh, 
different views and different places. And I would imagine, I, I don't know, I didn't do that. Um, but my understanding of it is that you can. And sure, and, and time just does not exist the way we think of time. Time only exists in relation to space. It, it just pinpoints a place in space and time. I kind of think that question was coming from a, a skeptical perspective. Uh, many of the scoffers who are trying to find a more materialistic explanation for the near-death experience uh, come up with such hypotheses. Uh, Andrei Slavash Krasowski, speaking of skeptics, asks if you can use your knowledge of the skeptical way of thinking, which you once uh, had, and, and feeling while talking to skeptics, uh, would that help you maybe trying to convince them? And, and I suppose the, the, the premise of the question is that you really have an interest in convincing skeptics, uh, which you may not, but uh, let's talk about that. First of all, it would never work. Mm -hmm. I've been there, I've been a skeptic, and there's nothing anybody could ever say that would change my mind at that point. The only thing that would have changed my mind was to see it for myself, which I did. And it changed my mind. I really, um, I really don't have much interest in um, attempting to change people's minds because I don't think it's possible. I, I you know, it's almost the same with, with politics, you know, uh, why do people go on Facebook and, and go on and on and on about politics? Do they really believe it's gonna change anyone's mind? I don't believe it will. And any more than I believe this type of thing would change a skeptic's mind. I don't think there's anything I could say that would make someone change from a skeptic to a believer. I think the only thing that will do that is experience. As a matter of fact, I, I can attest that uh, uh, recently in a conversation and on this channel uh, with Jessica Utz, a professor of statistics who specializes in all of the scientific proof for the paranormal, um, he once in a lecture questioned her fellow statistics, uh, statisticians, that is, who, who were skeptical. And, and she said, what would convince you with the statistical evidence, the scientific data convince you? Almost none of them said they would be convinced by that. But she said, if you had a personal experience, would that convince you? And, th and they pretty much said, yes, that would convince them. A personal experience is far more convincing than we have 150 years of scientific evidence and proof. I, I bring this up because I know that uh, Skyworks 600 is asking about proof. Uh, uh, there's a mountain of proof, uh, actually. And the proof is very useful. Once you've had an experience, it reinforces what you've experienced. But for people who haven't had the experience, it's very, very hard simply to rely on the scientific evidence. There are some who do, but they're quite rare. Uh, here's a they're question. Oh, go ahead. It's, if, you, if you don't see it with your own eyes, it, that, that's what it took for me to be convinced. And I think for most people, they've got to see it for themselves and experience it for themselves. There are no words that are gonna change someone's mind. Well, we're near the bottom of the hour. And uh, so our program is almost over. I wanna remind our viewers that the New Thinking Aloud channel publishes a weekly newsletter. If you subscribe, uh, which you can for free, by going to the New Thinking Aloud Foundation website at New Thinking Aloud, all one word, and aloud is A L L O W E D dot O R G. That's the New Thinking Aloud Foundation as opposed to the New Thinking Aloud YouTube channel. Uh, you can subscribe for free to our weekly 
newsletter. And in addition to getting advance announcements about uh, our upcoming videos for the next week, and we release four to five every week, uh, we also include artwork, we include poetry, we include news announcements about upcoming events. The newsletter is very informative. It's very inviting. Uh, my wife, Janelle, who is biased, of course, uh, but who's also very experienced, says she thinks it's the most beautiful newsletter that uh, she receives, and she receives many. Uh, so I, I would like to encourage our viewers to take advantage of, of that. And uh, we have just one minute left, Elizabeth. Would you like to share a final thought? Uh, my final thought would be uh, to, to say thank you to you for having me on. And really, all I can, the most powerful thing about the entire near-death experience was the feeling of overwhelming, unconditional love that I experienced in the afterlife and the understanding that we are all part of one. We're all the same. And I think if more people could understand that and believe it and act as if that were true, uh, the world would be a much better place. Beautifully put. And thank you so much for being with me and with the New Thinking Aloud audience, Elizabeth. 